It is, it is again, so good to just get an opportunity to share in the Word with you tonight. Uh, again, like I was saying earlier, we were planning on having uh, baptism tonight, but um, again, I didn't have a call. Uh, I didn't have anyone sign up. I had a couple that said they wanted to be, and one had to have a birthday party with their family, and so they were not able to. And another one, um, they, were, they called me today and said that, that they were going to have to put it off for a little while. They had some family issues to take care of. And so we just, we're going to have another one. We'll have another one next month, and we'll believe the Lord's going to help us with that one, and God will work it out. Amen? And I, thank goodness I had another sermon. I, I told Ben, I said, I've always got something to preach. I've always got something that I've, that I've got on my thumb drive. This is a sermon that I uh, have been working on for some time. As a matter of fact, it's probably been almost a year now that I've been working on this sermon. I've had it on the thumb drive, and whenever I come in the office, I work on it a little bit, piddle around with it, and add some things to it. And it's about prayer. We're getting ready to start back into our prayer ministry on Tuesday night. Um, on Tuesday evenings at, at 7 o'clock, we have prayer here at the church. And we have... It's, it's something that I, I mention to everybody, but I, I say this all the time, that when we are, when you have a prayer service, it's the least attended church service in any church that I've ever been in. Never. Is there any, uh, is, is there a big turnout? People say, well, I can just pray here, I can pray there, and I, I don't have to be in the corporate setting, and I don't, there's something about it. God has put it on my heart um, this year. That prayer, that our Tuesday night prayer is going to be much more than just coming together, kneeling down and praying. I believe God is going to use it to do miracles in the community. I believe God is going to send people. When, when we first started on our original Tuesday evenings, when I first came here, God started opening up doors. We had people that would come in that, that we had never been here, walk in, and we'd pray for them. We saw miracles happen. We saw miracles happen, and we've seen our prayer teams uh, continue to grow and to minister, praying for needs. We're seeing miracles through our prayer team, and we're seeing positive things out of prayer. But I believe our time in prayer is what's going to bring, and Garrett and I were talking about revival. I believe prayer is what's going to bring revival, and I believe that you cannot have revival without breaking ground in prayer first. God will never give you what your heart is not prepared to receive. And the only way that I know to prepare your heart. The, Jesus did not say, my house will be a house of worship. Amen. I love worshiping God. And I love to worship. And I love to worship. I'll be the first one to tell you I'm ready to worship. When it comes time to worship, I am ready. But I will tell you this, that when it comes down to being prepared and being ready and taking just a minute to do that, one of the greatest things is, is that Jesus said, my house will be a house of prayer. When we come together, we must learn to pray. Prayer is something that we, God has called us all to do so that we could call on the Lord and pray. God did not call us to be in a, in a position of just a, being a church of worship or just being in a church uh, where we come together to worship. But it's, we come together, we must corporately realize the importance of prayer. Prayer is not just mealtime. Prayer is just not bedtime. Prayer is communicating with God. And when we pray, the Bible says, we move mountains. When we pray and believe... We can see miracles happen. When we pray and believe, nothing is impossible. When we become a people of prayer. A few weeks ago I preached, If my people which are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, then, then God says what he will do. I will heal their land. I will deliver their people. When we come to the place to where we realize the importance of prayer, God gives us the privilege of what to do. I'm gl glad God didn't say the way that you're going to be blessed is that you have to memorize all the scriptures in the Bible. That would be a tough time. Amen. I have a hard time going beyond John 3.16. I, 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 I have a hard time with, with the memory. And I know somebody said, well, the other day, well, you just need to clear your mind and work at it. I have tried to clear this mind and there is too much going on to clear it. 
But I will tell you this, I respect those who do and I respect those who can and I respect the effort that they place in it. But I will tell you something, I'm glad that with the word of God, God didn't say my house will be a house only where the Bible is read. He said my house will be a house of prayer. Brother Bledsoe, I believe if God's people get to the place to where their world falls apart, they will run to the house of God for prayer. They will seek out people to pray for them. When the need becomes great, they will desire prayer because they will want God to meet their need. We don't live in a day and age to when we're desperate any longer for God. We want the blessings, we want the outpouring, we want the influx of what God can bring to us. But oftentimes what we do is we want to, to have our chat with God. We want to we wanna tell God, we want to give God our, our wish list, and we want to tell God all these things. And sometimes we've got to realize that prayer is our direct line of communication with God. When we pray, we must believe. So for the next few weeks, I'm going to be preaching about prayer on Sunday nights. I'm going to talk tonight about praying bold, big prayers. Praying big, well, actually my title says praying big, bold prayers. Dyslexia kicks in and you read them backwards sometimes. But when you pray big, bold prayers, you, are the, you have the ability, you, you have a God who created the earth out of nothing. He spoke it and it began to happen. You have a God who knows the able, uh, abilities to do things great and mighty. God is not limited to our tangible evidence. And God is not limited to the things that we see here on this earth. And God is not limited to the possibilities of what we know. God is the God of impossibilities. God said all things are possible to them who believe. When we come to the place of realizing the importance of our believing, then we can realize how big our God is. You see, sometimes we get to the place to where we put God in a box and we limit him because we make him almost in a human form, saying, God, you can't reach around the world to touch. I'm going to tell you something. I believe right now that God can reach across this country and touch uh, Sandra in Mexico, getting ready for surgery tomorrow morning. And God's going to do a miracle. And I believe that God can reach to where she is when we pray here and agree here. God moves there. Amen. God is omnipotent and omniscient and omnipresent. God is everywhere at all times. God is all powerful and God is all knowing. When we realize the uh, impact of what that phrase means, we realize and we have the ability to trust in an almighty God. But we put God in a, in, a, in a box. We put God in the limitations of our humanness and we begin to think about God being able to do it like we can do it. How we can do it and the way we fathom it. When we can believe it, God can do it. Amen. When we have faith to believe, the Bible says, and Jesus told his disciples, if you speak to the mountain, say, be cast into the sea and believe. God says it's possible. I want to talk tonight a little bit about this scripture. And I've, I've looked this up a few, like I say, about a year ago, I started working on this, but it's found in 1 John. Naomi, if you'll go ahead and pull that up. It's in 1 John, the fifth chapter, starting in verse 14 and 15. There it is. The Bible tells us, in, and I'm going to be reading this out in the New King James Version. It says, now this is the confidence that we have in him. That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petition that he, we have asked of him. I'm not talking about just blabbing it and grabbing it and naming it and claiming it, if you will, and saying this is mine and I want this and I want a new car. And, and so we just say that I, I, I want a new car, God, and we begin to throw our little fit and we begin to throw our, our little, little tantrums about it. I want to, you know, you may be asking for a, a, a new husband or a wife. Amen. You may be asking for, I'm not saying anything, hon. I'm not looking at you when I said that, but I was just saying that someone might be saying, and, and, and sometimes we've got to realize that, that God, God's will is this, and God, God has a will in, in this whole thing. It says, and if we know that he hears us, if we know that he hears us, 
And we, uh, we've got to understand that our prayers are not vain and our prayers are not, uh, not something that we, we pray without confidence. Th- this is the scripture, and I want to I bring this up again, and I want to go back to verse 14. And he says, and now this is the confidence that we have in him. The confidence, that word confidence can be established as we have this basis of knowledge that we stand upon. The word confidence there is the knowledge to know this is something that we can stand upon. As one would stand upon a building block or one would stand upon the confidence of what you put your feet upon. Knowing that it is solid and knowing that it is not going to fall apart. Knowing that what you put your foot on is something that's going to last. When we put that confidence in it, we have it. When you realize the the ability and the work of God, you can have confidence in God. You don't have to wonder if God can. You have the confidence to know He can. When it comes down to the word confidence, it's the ability to trust in God. It's the ability to have faith in God. To when I say I have confidence that God hears my prayer, I know that He hears my prayer. The word confidence can oftentimes be misunderstood in the idea that we have a hope in this or we have a we 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 are lucky or we are. But I know that when I am praying, I have confidence that God hears my prayers. I never pray a prayer, Brother Bledsoe, that I don't think God hears. There's not an idle word that comes out of my mouth. There's not an idle thought that comes in my mind that God does not know it before I think it. Did anybody hear that? There's not an idle thought that goes through my mind that God doesn't know it already. There is not a a, a point that I say a word, even when no one else is around, God is there because God is everywhere at all times. When I think that nobody else is listening, God is. When I think that no one is understanding me, God is and God does. When it comes down to it, God is with me at all times. The confidence is is that I must have a total, complete belief that God is able to do what no other can do. I've got to have the confidence to know that when I pray, God is able. Is your God big enough to pray big, bold prayers? Is God able to? The question is, is that sometimes we have a lack of confidence. I know when David went before Goliath, he didn't have the confidence in his sling. He didn't even have the confidence in himself. But I know this, he had confidence in God. And he knew that the battle was not his, but it was God's. When David went against Goliath, though he had the opportunity to take Saul's armor and use it against Goliath, he knew that it was not, he was not equipped to use it. He, was not, he did not have confidence in it. He did not have confidence in the fact that he could swing the sword. He didn't have confidence in the way that it would work out, but he had confidence in God. I don't have confidence in, in, in lawyers sometimes. I don't have confidence in doctors sometimes. I don't have confidence in medicine sometimes. I don't have confidence in the money because money comes and goes. I don't have confidence in the things around me. And sometimes I don't even have confidence in the people that are around me. But I do have this. I know that God is able and God will not fail. God is faithful. I have confidence in him to know that that my God can do anything. I know that when I call upon the name of the Lord that he will move and he can move on my behalf. If I believe that God, if I have confidence in God, then we can know that he will do it. Later on in that verse he says, and we know that he hears us and we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him. When we have confidence to know, that means that when God, when we have the confidence to know God and we have the confidence in God, we know that he hears us and we have the confidence to know that when we pray, he answers. The difficult thing that we oftentimes run into is we have a lack of confidence. We have confidence in the things that we may muster up. We have confidence in a lot of things. That's why we live in a world and a generation when our faith seems weakened. But we must come to the place to where we realize all things are possible. Mark, the 11th chapter and verse 24 says, Therefore I say to you that whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. 
The Bible says Jesus told his disciples, and Jesus answered and said to them, have faith in God. We must come to the place to where we put faith, uh, take faith out of the minds of man and put faith in the hopes and the beliefs of God. Amen. Confidence cannot be limited to our abilities. This morning I preached a message about God is able in giving it to God and, and letting God have it. And God's got this was the title of my message. We must come to the place to where when we cast our, our prayers today, I knew some of the prayers that we prayed for in this altar today. When people were, when I laid hands on them, hope I knew that the minute that I put my hands on them and started praying, there were some that weren't going to believe it. They were, going to, they were walking away from this, Brother Bledsoe, they walked away from this altar saying, I hope he does, but I've asked this before. I hope he does, but I don't know. I had some that said, I don't think things will ever change. I don't think things will ever be different. Sometimes when we pray, we've got to believe. We've got to pray and believe. We have this confidence in God. We have this faith in God. Sometimes we get mad at God because we have faith and we believe, but we don't see the answers. I can say this in Mark, the 11th chapter, and I'll read one more scripture. And it says, For assuredly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, and he will have what he says. One of the things that we have to realize is that there are things that puts God in a box and begins to tie God's hands. The first thing that I want to say is that we must understand and believe. Secondly, I realize that not only believing, but if there is unforgiven sin in our lives, we must deal with our sin. This is not a very popular part of this message. That believing and getting what you want and praying and seeing the mountain moved. But there are also things that we must deal with. There is sin in our hearts. Amen. And if there is sin in your life and sin in your heart and there is sin that's, that's in your life and you know about it and you don't do anything about it, then you are hindering your ability for God to answer your prayer. Sin is simply this, to know to do good and do it not to him it is sin. If I know something is wrong and I know that something that I shouldn't do and I go ahead and do it and God's dealt with me and I continue to walk through that, then I am walking in direct rebellion to God and God cannot, by His own word, give you what you desire. Sin is something that we must deal with. The Bible says confess your fins, sins Confess your sins before God and he is faithful and just to forgive you of all of your unrighteousness. Tonight, if you're here and there is sin in your life and you know that there is sin that exists, if you know that there are things that you have done wrong, be faithful and know this, that if I confess my sins, he will forgive me. I can't work it. I can't pay enough. I can't do enough to be saved. I simply have to believe that God's son's blood will wash away my sins. And, and, and if I confess my sins, then I must know and realize that. I'm glad, thankful, so thankful. James, I'm thankful that I don't have to go through and list all the things that I've done wrong to get an answer from God. You see, God already knows everything I've done. But when I confess that I am a sinner... When I confess, Lord, I have sinned, and I look at God and I say, God, you know my sin. God, I ask you to forgive me of it. Sometimes we think that we have to confess, and a lot of times we're raised in a denomination or a belief where confession is, must be given to a priest, and, and that priest then must take it before God to see. I'm going to tell you something. Uh, when God, God sent his son, Jesus Christ, he became my high priest, and I don't have to go through anybody. I can go directly to him and say, Father, forgive me, who knows all my sins, and know that he is faithful and just to forgive me. If we're going to see God move and answer, if we're going to have the confidence, then we must remove any hindrance that may be between us and God. Secondly, we must remove any hindrance that is between us and any people. We must come to the place to where if I have uh, un, uh, unforgiveness in my life, where I have bitterness against someone, perhaps they've done me wrong, I still have to go to that person and ask God to forgive them. I must say, Father, forgive me and forgive the way that I treat them. Help me to forgive. And when I learn to forgive, if I have unforgiveness, the Bible says it will cause God not to hear my prayer. And I will not be forgiven if I don't forgive. 
forgiveness and understanding the forgiveness to forgive others. I never will forget when I was called to preach and I was a young man going through and, and I had a pastor that I had trained under and working in children's church. And I went to him and began to talk to him, James, about wanting to be in the ministry. And I told him, I said, I'd like to go into the, to the role and, and train and go into the MIP program, the minister's intern program in the church. And I said, I'd like to study to do that. And he said, no, you stay right where you are. You just keep working children's church. Don't you, you don't need to do anything else. And I kept, God kept putting it on my heart. I kept waking up at night dreaming about preaching and got literally thousands of people before me that, that would reach out and they were reaching out and I believe God was calling me to that place. And I went and told my mother-in-law she was working for the state overseer. I was, happened to be in the state office and I was telling her a little bit about it. When I began to explain to her a little bit about my, my dreaming and what I was dreaming about that, she said, you need to tell the overseer. When I went to tell the overseer, the overseer said, you need to get in the MIP program. I said, I, it's what I was saying. He said, you don't, I don't care what that pastor says. You get in there and you go through the MIP program. I'm moving you from this church and I'm putting you over here. I moved across town to a church that was actually closer to my home. We went there and I started going to church there and literally bitterness and anger, all the things that were said and some things that were said against us and some things that were, were told and they weren't true and a lot of things. And, and, and I, I began to, to realize the bitterness and anger had been again, again to set in. And I knew that the pastor that was there was, was, was angry at me because we had left and because I had went over his head, if you will, and I went to tell, and the overseer, I went to tell my mother-in-law who was over the overseer, <clears throat> she said, and so what she said got done. Anyways, we were at a prayer, we were at a service in a camp meeting service and there was a prayer setting at the, evangel, at the altar service and I was up front praying and all of a sudden the Lord said, you go and forgive him. I said, but Lord, I don't, I don't need to forgive. He needs to forgive me. I, I, don't, I have nothing against him. I, right now, he needs to forgive me. And God said, you do what you know to do. And you go to him. And I will begin to heal. And here's what happened. You know, I went back there and I, he was towards the back. He was back there doing his walking back and forth. And so I went up to him, James, and I walked up to him and I put my, uh, kind of put my arm around him. And I said, I need, to, I need to ask your forgiveness. I want you to forgive me. And when I put my arm around him, I expected one of those holy angel moments where it goes, ah. I expected, the, I expected the, the, just a, a hush to fall over the room and him to look at me and embrace me and say, it is okay. And we hug and we walk around together and we're all happy and hunky-dory. Did you know what he said? That's fine. It's no big deal to me. I, 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 I just, I, tur I couldn't believe it. He turned around and walked away and I was thinking, where's the ah? Where's the hug? Where's the, where's the moment of tranquility that was going to come? And God said, you can't control what anybody else does, but you can do what I tell you to do and ask for forgiveness and to forgive. Later on, years later, that minister and I got together again. God had, had let the healing process continue and, and, and the Lord really touched and, and the ministry relationship. He opened up his heart, opened up some things for us when we moved back there. And it was just a blessed time that we were able to have fellowship but this is the real thing that we must realize. That without the forgiveness, without the obedience to forgiveness, we will never see the work of God and what God can do. We will limit ourselves. Thirdly, we must pray according to God's will. The scripture is easy to skip over and a lot of times we don't even think about it. It says, for this is the confidence that we have in him. That if we have ask anything, hold on, there's a little phrase right there. It says, according to to his will. If we, if we are not careful, we'll pray prayers that are not God's will. 
Believe it or not, when Jesus was here, he didn't heal everyone. He healed those who were, he was given an opportunity to heal. And many times, many in the same place, all were healed, the Bible says. But not everyone that was sick on the earth when Jesus was here was healed. And sometimes when we pray, I saw a prayer request come through and it said, God, I pray that everyone in, that has cancer would be healed at this moment. That's a, that's a prayer that's vain. That's a prayer that's not going to happen. You're praying for God to give them strength, praying for God to touch them, praying for God to minister to them, praying for God to give them the endurance and the ability to stand against the trial that they face. But it may be God's will that he's working to make a testimony out of their, their circumstance that they're going through. We need to search out the will of God in the situation that we pray for. It is God's will to heal, but how God's will to heal happens in his circumstance. When Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane and he prayed, he wasn't praying to get out of going to the cross. He was praying for the ability to endure the cross. He was praying, said, God, if this be your will, if it's not your will, take this cup from me. But if it is your will, give me the strength to endure. Jesus was not praying to get out of the cross. He knew that he had to die. He was knowing the cruelty of the cross. He knew the punishment of the cross. He knew the, the depth of the pain that he was about to suffer. And he knew that it would take that. Jesus could have said, get me out of this mess. They're not worth it. And he would have been right. But he chose to endure the cross so that we would be saved. He chose to endure the cross so that we might understand salvation. And he submitted to the will of the Father instead of his own. When it, we think about the will, sometimes our will is so that we don't have pain and so we don't hurt and so we don't suffer. But we've got to understand sometimes God uses our pain to become a microphone to speak for him. Out of the midst of our circumstances, God can use that and make it for his glory and his honor. It is in those difficult situations, as I was preaching this morning, it is in those difficult situations that God wants us to depend on Him so the miracle, He can get the credit for it and not us. When we pray according to that way of God, whatever your will is, it's not giving up to the weakness of the flesh. It's not giving in to the work. Sometimes we pray and we say, God, if it is your will... What is the will of God? Here it is right here. This is a testament. This is God's will for you right here. According to this that I have in my hand, this is the New Testament. This is the covenant of God for you. A lot of times we, I don't know if you've ever been to a will. I, I've never been to one. I've been, I've helped out in writing one. My parents have a, a living will, and they have, my grandmother had a will, and I was there, and I've seen it on TV. I don't know how realistic that is, but when they sit down and they, they open it up, it's a sealed document, an attorney signs it, and they tell you what, you can re, what you're going to receive and how much you're going to get, and, and you wait, and then finally when he's finished, he tells you, and you can receive it. I told, my kids were telling me, they said, Dad, what kind of a living will do you and Mom have? You can have everything we have. All the payments. You can have everything we owe money on. It's all yours. You can have it. But I, I got, I, the realization is, is that sometimes we don't realize that that book is a book of promise to us from God. That is His will. You want to know what God wants you to do? You want to know where God wants you to go? You want to know what, how to live? You want to know what's right and what's wrong? It's all there. What is your will, God? What is your will in my... I have so many people say, I'm not sure what God's will is for my life. Get in the Word of God and He'll reveal it to you. He'll make it known to you. God has already equipped you with the ability to do what He tasks you for. His will, He will never give you more to do and more to task to get done than He is not willing to supply you the ability to do. His will will get you through according to His will, is not taking ourselves out of the picture, but it is trusting God to explain it and show it to us. What's my next move, God? I have a young friend of mine that went to the missionary field. He had to go to the traveling in a distance, and he was called to speak. He told the church, he said, I would love to go, but I don't have the money. 
He began to pray and he said, God, you're going to have to supply the money so that I can go there. There are people that need to have the word preached to them. There's a community there in this native place where he was going and he said, I don't have the money to go and God, you're going to have to supply it. And as he was praying, God brought him to a scripture that said, go and I will supply. He went and as he was traveling, he traveled to the airport. When he got to the airport, he was sitting there and he's just doodling, you know, I don't know what you do. So I guess nowadays we just sit on our phone, but he began to, he was sitting there in the airport and he said he just went to the airport and he was sitting there. He didn't know, that's just, he said, God said, go. So he went to the airport. He said, that's the only way I was going to get there. When he's sitting there in the airport, a guy walked up to him, put his hand around him. He said, listen, I want to tell you something. He said, I, I've got tickets that I bought that I can't use. Circumstances have come up in my family. I noticed you were just sitting there. Something prodded me to come over and give you these tickets. They gave him the tickets. He looked at the destination. He didn't even know where the tickets were for. He looked at the destination. It was exactly where the airport that he needed to go to. He said, thank you, God. He said uh, uh, he had his bags packed. He said, what in the world made that guy come over? He said, so I didn't know. I didn't know what, I, what was going to happen, but I knew God was able, and I just obeyed God, and what his will was was for me to preach the gospel, and he opened up the doors for me to go, and when I went, I went there, and God touched, and the people were saved in the power of God, and he said the sad thing was is I wasn't sure it wasn't a round-trip ticket. I didn't know when I was going to get to go home. He said he started to pray and he started to pursue God and ask God. He said, God, how long do you want me to stay? God said, I'll supply. Another week went by, month went by, year went by, and he said, God, how long am I going to get to stay? God was moving in his midst and the revival was happening, but he, but he knew he needed to go back and he knew he needed to take care of some things. And he said, God, when am I going to go? And God said, stay, stand and see that I am, I am God. He says, be still and know that I am God. And he kept standing there and he just kept saying, God, I know you're going to supply this. Somebody from the church that was saved during his ministry while he was there came up to him and he said, you may not remember me. I was one in the, one of the first services that you were here. And he said, I don't know when you want to go home, but I am going that way. I would love to have company to go with me. And he said it was an amazing moment because at that very moment, he said, I had just told the Lord that day, I don't think I can stay here any longer. God moved and made an opportunity for it to happen. And the power of God opened up the doors that need to open. And when he closes them, he will close the doors. But you have to be willing to listen to God. And you have to be willing to listen to the work of God and the word of God to find God's will. Sometimes we make it more complicated than that. Sometimes we make it more complicated. Sometimes we don't have the patience enough to know God's will. Sometimes we don't have enough patience to listen to the voice of God. But when we listen, God will answer. He said if we ask anything, we can ask amiss, we can ask according to the will of God. Target your prayer as best you can to the most smallest point. Uh, there's a, uh, a movie that, that came out. Joe, I can't remember the name of it. I think it was Patriot. And anyways, he tells his boys he's gonna, they're going to shoot some soldiers. And they were the redcoats. And he tells his boys, he said, aim small and miss small. Aim small and miss small. The smaller your target, the more apt you are to hit what you're shooting at. If you're going to shoot at something, don't look at If I'm going to shoot back there and I'm going to try to, to, to hit Rose, I'm not going to aim in that general direction. I'm going to target Rose right on her nose so I can shoot her right there in the nose. The nose of Rose. I'm going to aim as narrow as I can. When I pray, I must target my prayer as precise as I can and pray. And when I get defined and refined, the more refined I can become, the more that I can target my prayers. God, keep me safe during this day. Lord, here's what I'm going to tell you something. There's nothing wrong with that prayer. Keep me safe this day. But if I know I have a task to take on, if I know I have a circumstance that I'm going to have to face, point that prayer to God and target that prayer and say, God, work this miracle out. The smaller I aim, the, the better my target will be. 
When we think about asking God, asking general prayers sometimes gets general answers. When I say, speak to this mountain and be cast into the sea, I've got to understand, first of all, it is, is it God's will for that mountain to be moved? <laughs> Come on now. <laughs> is it God's will for that mountain to be moved? Is there a reason that that mountain is there? And secondly, I've got to have the ability to say, God, if you want to move this mountain, help me to target my prayers so that mountain is the precise target that I pray against. Literally, that was an example that Jesus was giving to tell us an illustrated message that when we pray, target your prayer to that target and say, God, I believe you can do it and believe God to move the circumstances so the situation will be changed. When I target my prayers, I can believe God. You see, prayer changes things. Prayer changes the heart of the one who prays. Prayer changes and touches the heart of God. Prayer moves mountains and changes situations. When we pray, do not be conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. When we come to the place of praying that prayer of the will of God and the acceptable will of God, I don't believe there's levels and degrees of, of God's will. I don't believe there's a good will. There's an acceptable will and there's a perfect will. I believe that all of it is under the standard of God. God has a will and it's written here. And when we follow that will, we'll see God move in the midst of the circumstance. When we pray. Dave and Faith, I'm about to close. Jesus, when he prayed in the garden, when he surrendered his will to God, he saw God change the circumstances. And the Bible says that after he had surrendered that and he had done his prayer, that the angel appeared to him and gave him strength so that he might endure what he had to be, be strengthened from. When we pray, God will send us angels to give us comfort and assurance of his work and his help. When we pray, we must believe that we touch God, speaking those words and not praying in the vainness of hope. When we pray, we must believe. Ask, the Bible says, and you shall receive. Seek, seek and you shall find. Knock, and it will be opened unto you. When you pray. I was looking into my sermon. In the next few weeks, I'll be preaching the scripture that says, Man ought always to pray and not faint. You see, I believe that we can continually be in prayer with the hope and the belief of God. It is not enough just to hope that God will. It's to believe that God will. I never will forget. I'm going to close with this last story. My dad was a great man of prayer and great man of faith. Saw my dad pray over a lot of circumstances. When I was 12 years old, my sister was 10. She went in the hospital. And for the better part of about eight months, she was diagnosed with cancer of the liver. The liver began to swell and her color changed and she turned yellow and she was in the hospital. God kept praying for healing. God, my father kept praying for healing and healing. Wanted her healed and wanted her healed. He prayed and prayed and I, day and night all the time nothing was happening my sister was getting worse seemed like the sickness was going to be prolonged so my dad went down to the chapel the doctor said there's nothing more we can do my dad went down to the chapel and as he was praying there James the Lord spoke to my dad and said do you want me to heal her God spoke this almost to an audible place to my dad's heart and said, do you want me to heal her the way I want to heal her or the way you want her to be healed? He said, I can keep her alive and she will lay there and suffer or I can heal her with the most majestic healing that she'll ever receive. My dad broke and he said, Lord, I want your will and healing however you choose to heal. Within a matter of just a few hours, my dad went up to the room. When he went back up to the room, my sister's condition began to change. In the next few hours, she was talking about seeing angels, seeing things happen. God was preparing her. And the next thing, that the very next minute, she took her last breath. God said, I healed her. I healed her in a miraculous way. 
she'll never hurt again. I got angry with God because I didn't understand what God was doing. So I went through a few years of rebellion to God and angry with God, frustrated with God because it didn't go the way I wanted. Now I remember I was sitting in a service, in a youth service, and God seemed to open up heaven, showed me a beautiful cloud. And that cloud was a window that opened up like a little square. My sister opened up the window. She had bright red hair, real pretty red hair. She leaned out that window and, and she looked at me and just waved at me. And she said, everything is okay. And I, I was that confirmation that God said, I'll do it my way. When you trust God, he will do what he can. And sometimes we have to trust God even in the difficult situations to say, God, I don't know what, you're, what you want to do in this, but I trust you when you pray. Tonight, I'm going to ask you, if you will, just to stand with me right now across this place. I'm not going to do a real long altar call. But I want you to pray. The other day, everybody, I think just about everybody, some of you may not know I've been suffering with a knee injury and my knee's been hurting and it's been sore. I've been praying for it, praying for it. When I was at youth camp, I prayed for it. I didn't have, I went a week. I chased around a bunch of little kids, carried some of them up and down hills and all over camp. My knee didn't hurt one minute. I thought, Lord, you've healed me. I got home. I was, all of a sudden, it started hurting again. I said, Lord, I thought you healed me. I thought you healed me. I got to limping around, and the other day I was feeling sorry for myself. My dad called me and out of the blue, and he said, hey, how's your knee doing? I said, well, it's hurting again. He said, I thought you were healed. I said, well, I thought I was too. And he said, well, he said, I guess we're going to have to pray and we're going to have to believe God to touch. He said, son, did you ask God to heal you? And I said, yes. He said, then you need to begin to believe you're healed. He said, you... I went to a doctor the other day and he said, well, we need to shoot you with this shot. And we need to do these things and you need to, and, and all, and he went through all these details and he said, but I'm not sure it'll work. And I thought, well, that doesn't sound good. Then he said, we can do surgery, but I'm not sure if that'll do any good. And I walked out of that office with a lot of confusion. And the, I got in the car and I was driving home and my dad called me. Hey, how'd the doctor's appointment go? Ah, uh, they don't know what they're doing. They're not even sure if they can fix it. You know what? The Lord spoke to me and said, if you trust me, I can do it. And I was sitting in that car and when I was driving home and I was kind of feeling sorry for this whole thing going on. And all of a sudden I just said, God, you got this. You got this. That's where this message came that I preached this morning. I just said, God, you got this. I don't know how long I'm going to have to deal with this. Limp around, gimp around. I'm tired of it. I don't like to do it. I, get up, I was up there working on James's guitar. I was going to have to help him, have him stop playing for a minute and help me get up for a second there. But I, you know what I said? God, you got this. You got this. Whatever you do, you got this. 